you're in harmony with your environment, so many magical things happen. Well, if we could bring that sense of harmony and peacefulness and cooperation into the workplace, imagine, imagine how much better off our working environments would be. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hello there and welcome back to the show. Hope you're doing really well. It's great to have you here, just as it is my uh, old friend and guest who is returning to the show, Mr. Stephen Howard. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And you can drop the adjective old, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, well, look, you know, old as in long-term friend. No, look, it's, it's, wonder <laughs> it's wonderful to, to have you here. Now, um, you're an award-winning author, and we're going to be talking about the rate of change in the business environment pre-COVID and how that rate of change has now hit warp speed and what this all means to the way in which we work and lead. Now, before we do all of that, we know that you've been on the show before. And since that time, we've had a lot of people join us as listeners. So they don't know much about you. So I'm wondering if we can go over the basics. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, calling from Mexico City or just outside Mexico City. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Now, I know that you, you, you used to live in Australia and, and other places abroad. Tell us a little bit about your journey through life in that regard. Well, I've spent over half my adult life living out, you know, outside the United States. You can tell by the accent, born and bred in the United States, educated in the U.S. But I lived in Singapore for 21 years, worked for four major multinational organizations, and then went off and did my own business and then moved to uh, Victoria, Australia, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. little country town called Gisborne out in the Maston Ranges, beautiful spot, beautiful part of the world. And I lived there for 12 years. And about 10 years ago, I moved back to the United States. My dad was having some health issues. I became his primary caregiver. And, you know, just as things rolled on, I just uh, ended up staying in the U.S., built finally built a business network in the U.S. And now I, I kind of divide my time between Southern California and Mexico City. So Fantastic. That's, that's it. And so, and what do you do in your pastime? I know that you've been busy writing books. So I guess that would be a large part of it. <laughs> that's all. That's a large part of it, it uh, and, and helping others um, uh, write and publish their books as well. So between my my leadership, mentoring, and consulting business, and and now helping people publish books, I'm pretty flat out, as as they say. As uh, as they say. Now, tell us a little bit about Caliente Leadership. Now, as a business, where did you come up with that wonderful name, Caliente? Caliente in Spanish, most some of your listeners will know, means hot, but the second definition means passionate. And as you know me, I'm a little bit passionate about leadership. <laughs> and Just also where, bit. yeah, and where I live in Southern California, the land is actually owned by the uh, Agua Caliente Hot Water Band of Indians. So oh. we pay a, a land lease to our Native Americans. So it's kind of my tribute to our Native American land uh, holders, as well as the, the passionate side of, uh, of the business as well. Thank you for sharing, Steve. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, your, I guess, your lifestyle. I love, to, love the fact of where you are. Do you, do you enjoy local cuisine? What's your favorite oh. foods? Oh, I, I absolutely love it. Uh, I just had a soup the other day for the first time called pozole, which is a traditional Mexican soup that they oh. serve on Mexican Independence Day, which was last week. Um, there's the cochinicha. The, uh, Mexico's a little bit, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it, every part of Mexico has a different cuisine. So cochinicha comes from the Yucatan Peninsula on the southeast part. You'll have other things that come from Oaxaca, like cheeses, which is kind of the south, almost southwest part of the country. Um, yeah, many, many wonderful foods here. So, so you're I, very, I need, you're, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, I need to learn how to cook it. One of my, one of my <laughs> other, my other hobby is my pastime is I love to cook. Uh, but right now I'm pretty much cooking, you know, Western food. So my, uh, my next goal now is to really sit down and learn how to cook. I've, cook uh, Latin food and Mexican food. And I've done one dish. It came yeah. out all right. I need to learn more. <laughs> now, well, you're definitely a foodie. Now, tell us a little bit about culture. What do you like to do? Is there events you enjoy going to whilst uh, in the location? 
you know, my girlfriend and I, we, we share some similar interests. And one of them is we love to visit museums. And Mexico City, believe it or not, I think has the largest number of museums of any city really? in the world. Now, Mexico City, by the way, is like a population of 23 million. So that's basically roughly the, the population of Australia. Yes, yes. So, so we, uh, once a month, we will go out on a sa Sunday and to a museum that we haven't visited, sometimes two if they're close by to each other, and then have a nice, you know, late afternoon lunch or something like that. So there are so many museums here, which is really nice to uh, to visit. See, I can I can tell that you'd be familiar with some of the, obviously, the, the wonderful, peaceful spots when you're in a museum, how quiet it is. And I wonder, how much value do you take away from quiet times in your life, do you think? Oh, I, I thrive on quiet time, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I get up every morning around 5 or 5.15, partly just to sit on the balcony and watch the sun come up with a cup of coffee yeah, and beautiful. hear nothing, nothing but birds and the wind. <laughs> so I thrive on it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is that the, the time you enjoy writing, Steve? Do you write in the morning? I, I you know, it, I don't have a set pattern. I, I will block time off. What I've learned over the years, and I've been, you know, publishing now books for 30 years, I guess. Um, I'm very good if I block three hours off. I turn my, I actually put my phone on airplane mode and I will get into the writing. And if I'm, I don't allow, allow myself to be disturbed. So yeah. I can write anywhere. I write in hotel rooms. I write here in my office. Uh, sometimes I write on the balcony. It, it really doesn't matter. I do, I, I don't write on airplanes as much anymore, but I do a lot of my editing work on airplanes. I think about uh, airplane journeys and I often like to listen to audio books on a flight. Do you listen to audio books at all? A little bit. Quite frankly, I'm still a reader, I, I but I, I read on Kindle. So almost like 95% of what I read now, I will load onto my Kindle yep. and travel with it. And, I, you know, which is nice because you can have five or six, seven books or more on your Kindle and, uh, and you don't have to carry all those heavy paperbacks <laughs> with you. <laughs> exactly right. Now, do you find you're more creative as a writer with a pen or a keyboard? Yeah, I actually do my first draft in pen mostly. I, I, uh, I'll i do an outline on, on uh, paper, type it up, and then I, I, I refer to my outlines as I go forward. So whereas I do each chapter, now I'm pretty much still a, a right, on, right on a yellow legal pad, quite frankly. Yeah, because there is some power in the pen, isn't there? The emotion seems to flow differently. It does for me. I know every every writer is a little bit different. It certainly does for me. Uh, I know that it it uh, like you said it flows, and I just get get it out. I know when I type. I would new compositions or new work on a keyboard I pause too often and start editing it I don't know what it is yeah. maybe because I do a lot of my editing on the key uh, on the computer screen so yeah writing and with a cup of coffee uh, or a glass of wine depending on the time of oh, day very good. yes uh, <laughs> works really well for me <laughs> <laughs> well you know like I said I'm in McLaren Vale so I can always send you some nice red <laughs> well we'll take you up on that I miss I miss, I miss Aussie wines although I, I am discovering a whole bunch of really nice Latin wines wines and Mexican oh. wines too surprisingly I've really really found some nice uh, a nice drop over here yeah I think I think it's important for context Steve that we share a little bit about I guess your your writing experience and background and uh, talk us through some of the, the the topics you're in the near the 30s now in terms of the number of books you've written yeah, this is number 22 of my own, but I've also written, uh, ghost written nine others in a, a personal development series. I, I started, my very first book was about branding. I mean, my, my background, my career background was marketing, branding. Yep. First book was about corporate image um, without without talking about logos, without colors, really talking about the corporate image of the um, the culture of the organization and how mm -hmm. you how you inculcate that and then use that to build your brand. Um, then I wrote some books. Uh, they were kind of collections of quote books, Asian quote books. Um, I, I wrote um, a couple of the marketing books on uh, very short chapters called um, 50 Powerful Marketing Minutes. So you could read each chapter in roughly a minute, minute and a half. And mm -hmm. there was like 50 of them. So that was the, you know, most of the early writing. Uh, and then now the last five or six books have been focused on leadership, which is where my career has taken me, where my passion has taken me. And I've got, uh, I've got books aimed at new leaders, particularly young leaders, um, 
It's called Eight Keys to Becoming a Great Leader, which is a very, very boring title. But the, <laughs> subti the subtitle is what the younger generation likes. The subtitle of that book is called Tips and Techniques from Gibbs, Yoda, and Captain Jack Sparrow. Oh, of course. Gibbs, in Australia, they probably don't know Gibbs so well. Gibbs is, is a TV show in the United oh, States. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Well, NCIS. So, yeah, oh, I guess absolutely. you know that. Yeah, okay. So, you know that. Yeah, I'm watching He's, it every other night. There you go. Well, he's the he's the ex-Marine command and control type leader. Uh, Yoda, of course, is your philosophical leader, and Captain Jack Sparrow is your get into trouble and get out of trouble type leader. <laughs> but he builds he builds great loyalty amongst his band of pirates. Um, so I'm not not necessarily encourage people to be pirates, but I'm encouraging <laughs> people to learn how, learn leadership skills from him. So uh, yes. yeah, that's that's quite good. Absolutely. Now, uh, in terms of your latest works, um, you know, we've obviously touched on the, this issue around COVID. Where did the idea for this book came from? I know that it's COVID related, but um, talk us through it. Yeah, I was uh, been wanting to write a book about people leadership for quite a while. Uh, the other leadership books were, you know, like I said, kind of more general in, in tonality, basic leadership skills, and and you um, know, and I started the more I talked to people during the pandemic of how to lead and remote workers, the mistakes people were making, not showing empathy for their workers, not understanding uh, that uh, people have uh, lives and, and responsibilities outside the workplace. And I kind of wanted to write something that would change people's mindsets. And so there is a little bit of controversy in this book. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I've, I even at one point in the book tell people, to tell leaders to fire their human resource department uh, and then hire them back 30 minutes later as the human capability abilities department. So just changing the concept of what HR means in a particularly larger organization. So so it just all came together. And then uh, I'm sure you want to talk about the title at one point, but I, I ended up coining a word for the title, which yes, uh, has really, have really resonated with people. So that's, that's really how it came about. Well, I think that's a good start point to talk about um, how you coined Humony. Tell us about it. Well, Humany, I, I uh, was just playing around one night. This was with a glass of wine, I have to admit, and out on the balcony good. watching the sun go down <laughs> and, and just thinking about, you know, and I kept telling myself, leaders, and, and one of the phrases I came up with, uh, which is actually uh, kind of off of Yoda, you know, Yoda, his, his, he taught us that we, we need to unlearn what we've learned. And I was playing around with that phrase in my mind. And I started thinking leaders need to unlearn management. Nobody wants to be managed. People want to be led. And I kept thinking about that man leading and, and they need to learn to be human again. I kept playing with the word human and how does human and humanity uh, apply to leadership. And then I, then I started thinking about the workplace and all the conflict and drama in the workplace. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, it's a shame we don't have harmony. People need harmony coming out of the pandemic. And then those th thoughts just combined at one point, uh, literally like the, the typical light bulb moment that goes yeah, off. Right. So, so I combined the words human, humanity, and harmony, uh, and to focus on, you know, the need to lead people but also for leaders to create workplaces of well-being and harmony. And it has resonated with everyone I've talked to about. Uh, interestingly, when I do ask people about, you know, tell me about the harmony in your workplace. People laugh at me. They scoff at me. They say, there's no such thing as harmony in yeah. the workplace. Yep. And I thought, good. Well, that's what I want to encourage. I want to encourage people to stop and pause. And Because think about it, Rick. If, when we, as individuals, when we are in harmony with ourselves or with life in general, what happens? We get into flow we get creativity going i mean whether it's like you know you hosting a podcast or working on a personal project or whatever yep. it has to be when you're in harmony with the world whether you're in harmony with your environment so many magical things happen well if we could bring that sense of harmony and peacefulness and cooperation into the workplace imagine imagine how much better off our working environments would be that's just that's amazing. That's just so enlightening, isn't it? You know, to have that light bulb moment. It, uh, yeah, I bet you couldn't grab that pen fast enough. 
Oh, it was in my hand. I was writing it down and scratching other ideas off. And but boy, when I but when I wrote the word humany, and I circled it so fast, and it just like it, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can you know I think there's some definitions that we need to break down for people because there'd be a lot of um, startup entrepreneurs, as you know, those who are looking to start a business, but they really don't have a great grasp of what we're really talking about. So let's go down to the fundamental level and start breaking down these different elements, starting with leadership. What's your perspective on leadership? What well, is it? leading, you're leading people. Um, you, you manage, and they say, this is where we got to get to. People think about, well, I got to manage people. No, you, you don't, you, you should not try to manage the people working for you. That's a 1980s construct. Yep. Uh, you need to lead people. So you, the, what I say in the book is you, you manage things, you manage projects, you manage processes, you manage policies, you manage procedures, but you lead people. And that alone is such a huge mind sh mindset jump for people, uh, shifting their mentality that uh, I, I need to lead people. Because in honesty, Rick, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I can't wait to go to work today and be managed. Or even yeah. worse, I, I, I can't wait to be micromanaged by my oh, boss. Oh, yes. Nobody wants that. And that's one of the contributions, I would argue, to the great resignation. And, and now we're seeing these stories about so-called quiet quitting, where people say, you know what, you're going to pay me for your, you want to pay me for my time, you want to manage me, I'll work nine to five, I won't do anything above and beyond what my job scope says. And that's what this quiet quitting uh, trend is all yes. about that's uh, hitting social media these days. So this is about really truly empowering those who are there to uh, deliver outcomes for your organization. Now, I guess it's almost bordering on a little level of um, not only competence, but a level of respect for individuals as human beings, isn't it? It is, and the two fundamentals of this are respect and trust. Um, so, so, and so again, one of the mindset changes I'm are suggesting for people is, I'm, and I've had bosses that do this. Bosses who come in, you know, take over a department or take over an organization, they'll say things like, "Here's how you earn my trust." Huh. I don't think that works today either. No. I, think you, I think you need to come in and say, "You have my trust. Here's how you can lose my trust." You know and tell them maybe it's by you know hiding secrets or not coming to me soon enough or not raising issues quick enough uh, you know that's that's how you can lose my trust nobody needs to build your trust um no. i think that's part of it um the second aspect of this is um because people ask me so you're talking about people instead of profits you're, you're talking about like socialism and that no no no, 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 no not no. at all i'm talking about people before profits yep. um it's not people over profits because that's either or it's people plus profits because you will get greater results if you create a harmonized environment if you treat people with respect and trust and you know you'll get higher cooperate uh, cooperation, you get higher innovation, higher productivity. Uh, it's as really as straightforward as that. And if if people that feel confidence working for their leader, and they and they trust them and they feel empowered, how much how often do you see them coming out of their shell? When, especially when something's gone wrong and they've cost the business money, does it does it help them overcome problems like that? It very much so. Google did some research. I uh, I think it came out just in like the first year of the pandemic. And they did some research and found out that the number one factor for successful teams in, in Google yep. was, in, was in an environment of psychological safety where it was okay to make a mistake. It was okay to speak up and throw an idea out. You wouldn't be ridiculed for having an idea. Yep. Uh, the, uh, so this whole psychological safety and learning from your mistakes, moving forward, uh, and, and improving on that were the number one factors of uh, team success. And mm -hmm. so that, and, and that's, I kind of echo that in the book as well and saying, you know, this is the environment you need to create. Look, everyone makes a mistake. Um, and, and, and the opposite of that, the, the corollary of that, if you want the 180 degree version of that is as a leader, you also have to be humble and admit that you don't know everything because no leader can know everything in today's workplace. So you have to be confident enough to say, Hey team, you know what? I don't have all the answers. I I'm looking to you. I'm looking to you for your ideas. Let's work on this together. Together. We will come up with a, a great solution. Um, so I guess I'd summarize that up if you want in, in a in phrase I use in the book. I mean, years ago, uh, a leader wanted to be the smartest person in the room. Today, I suggest the leader needs to create the smartest room 
possible. Get the smartest yes. people you can find into that room and work with them and empower them. Send them the vision. This is what, this is the outcome we want. I'm going to trust you guys to come up the way we get there. See so this, um, I, the thought of uh, being vulnerable uh, in my past experience as a, as a leader in, you know, oil sure. and gas, if you like, a very, I guess, difficult environment to work with and, you know, uh, massively challenging uh, literal environments to work with. You know, being vulnerable was never a, a thing on the cards. Do you think vulnerabilities coming to the fore more nowadays or absolutely i absolutely i now look uh, look this is going to be hard for for those of us who are over 45 mm. this is going to be damn difficult and it's going to be uncomfortable but it's it, you know if you keep trying to lead the way you led before the pandemic, you'll be successful for a year or two, but you're going to end up spending more time replacing your employees, replacing your, your team members, than working on getting results because people are not going to put up with that anymore. I mean, people came out of the pandemic reevaluating the role that business and work plays in their life. And I had mm -hmm. so many people mm -hmm. say, you know what? I don't need to keep making more and more money. I can be happy with this or I can reduce it or I can, you know, I've learned that it's not worth commuting an hour and a half twice a day and coming home and my children are already asleep. I mean, I'd rather I'd rather work from home and read my children a book uh, to put them to sleep. Yeah, absolutely. Great feedback. Now, I, I, I think about um, how effective leadership and, and people in those leadership roles can be, especially now that we, we've touched on the great resignation, but we've also seen a, a, a massive jump in remote working. Um, how do you um, suggest leaders measure and know that they're being effective when having teams that are remote to them and they can't really micromanage anything? Yeah, you go, uh, managing went out the window in, in March 2020, uh, yeah, yeah. quite frankly. You, know, you had no more control. Um, yeah. I, it, you're going to have to change again. You're going to have to change the way you lead. And, you know, it, interesting, so many people say, well, you know, there's this bias, this inherent bias. If you're if you're remote, you won't get job promotions, you won't get new assignments, you won't get the plum assignments. That has to change. Um, just like leaders had to change, you know, with you know, over the last couple of decades, and and realize that, you know, women can work just as effective with men. You know, there's there's, there's I don't know if any assignments, but if they are very, very few assignments need to only go to men and, and, you know, women need to have the same opportunity and that mindset, mm -hmm. that thinking had to change. This thinking has to change now that, you know, they are, your, they're still your people. They may not be in the same physical location as you as often or all the time. doesn't matter. You're going to have to change your leadership style. And, and look, again, it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, yep. the, the chairman of Google, he made a comment earlier this year, and it just shocked me. He was on one of these TV shows, uh, business TV shows in the United States, and he said something along the lines of, I don't know how you teach leadership to remote employees. Well, my reaction is, and I put it in the book, I said, he and his board need to learn because that's going to be the future. And if you, you may not know how to teach leadership skills to people today and, and interaction skills to people who are remote, but that's the reality. You're going to have to learn how to do that. And it can be done, uh, mm. but he's, he's, uh, he's kind of a dinosaur. He's stuck so in the old methodology. <laughs> and this is what brings up my next comment, which is about ad adaptation and innovation. So does this mean that um, those who maybe are at the, the head of the ship with their hands on the steering wheel maybe need to look to new leadership or maybe retrain themselves or I shift think to the side? I think they have to train themselves. I mean, that's that's why I wrote the book, quite frankly. I mean, hopefully they'll yep. read the book or, or yep. I've got a bunch of videos on my YouTube channel kind of explaining it if, if you don't want to read it. But mm -hmm. you, I, yeah, this is a mindset change. You, you Like I said, you, you can be successful doing it the old way for maybe another couple of years, short term success. But if you want sustainable success, if you want your business to grow and grow, um, you're going to have to change your mindset. And, and another mindset change, quite frankly, is, you know, when, when we talk about human capital, which is a stupid phrase now, um, the um, when you talk about the cost of your workforce, the first thing I'm sure comes to your mind and everyone else's mind is things like payroll, medical leave, paid vacation leave, um, bonuses. No, when we talk in the future about the cost of human, human capital, we need to think about what is it costing us in terms of 
uh, human emotional, mental, and physical well-being. You know, working 60 hours a week is not healthy for anybody. It's not healthy for society. It's not healthy for your workforce. You burn people out, you're going to have to replace them. So we, leaders are going to have to start thinking about this constant focus on results, 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 more, more, more is going to have to be tampered down a bit and mm. understand that our role as leaders is to ensure that our people are maintaining mental, emotional, and physical well-being. I always enjoy having conversations with you. Now, I'd love to explore, if we could, Steve, um, the, the idea of 80-20, uh, the 80-20 rule as it applies to people-centric versus performance-centric. Does there need to be a balance between the two? Is it more 50-50 than it is 80-20, maybe? Uh, I think it's going to be more 80-20 in that, in that if you become people-centric in your focus and the things I talk about here in terms of how you lead your people through ambiguity, uh, how you uh, set the, the environment for greater cooperation, greater collaboration, I think then you're going to get the results. So the performance is going to increase. Yeah. But the way to get there, in some ways, it's like um, – uh, this analogy just came to my head, but it's kind of like somebody training uh, for like a, a triathlon or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The results don't come when you run it. You know, they come when you run the triathlon, but they they result because of the effort you put into the training. So everything you do yes. for, to, to increase your body, to set you up for success in a triathlon, yep. the same thing here. The more you the more you focus on your people leadership skills, the more you keep developing your people, training your people, um, uh, coaching your people, mentoring your people your results are going to show up. Yeah, you, don't have to you don't have to focus on, you don't have to have weekly reviews on, no, on, no. on, on numbers. Have yeah. weekly reviews on how you're growing your team. Well, the thing is that, that comes to my mind is this question of metrics, because obviously every leader that, again, is over the age of 45 is looking for ways, tangible ways, measurable numbers on the page to measure um, well-being and those yeah. softer sort of emotional-based um, parameters, if you like. How are we going to measure that? How are we going to know? Well, you, I tell you, you're already measuring it. You're just not looking at it. And so I'll tell you that you know, within 12 months, the sick days will go down. The, ah, the, the yes. lost work, that'll go down. Uh, and quite frankly, after a couple years or maybe less, depending on your relationship with your insurance company, when you start seeing fewer sick days, uh, uh, um, you see higher productivity, you see less drama, less conflict in your workplace, uh, less incidences that need to be you know, sent over to the HR department for mediation, your insurance costs are going to come down, particularly your yes. medical insurance costs. Are come down. Your recruitment costs are going to come down because people will want to work for you. I mean, right now, people's recruitment budgets are going through the roof as they try and replace people. That's going to yeah. come down. So great, we, great we have metrics in place for some of this stuff. Now, yeah, some of this no. stuff, maybe not. Um, mm -hmm. Not yet, but, at least. But, it, yeah, but it, and here's something nobody ever seems to measure. Um, and I've gone into companies recently and started advocating you measure this. So you have, let's say, 11 vice presidents in your organization. So you've got maybe 600, 800 employees, 1100, yep. 11 vice presidents. Whoever measures the attrition for each one of those 11 vice presidents and for the people below them, they measure a true employee attrition across the board. But mm -hmm. I go in there now and say, okay, so you're, so you got 12% turnover. Is that coming equally across all 11 of your vice presidents or, or one or two of them yes, having, the 80, 20. running 20% yes. and every, some others are running 3%. What's, <laughs> What's the difference? On? <laughs> wow, you start looking at that and eyes are opening up um, yeah. and, and saying, you know what, those two, those other two need to change a little bit. They, <laughs> they can't, you know, and, and they typically will be the alpha types, the, the bullies, the ones who shout a lot, um, the ones who push, 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 and they yeah. get great results. But that's what I mean. What's the cost of those results? The cost is in high employee turnover, uh, low employee motivation, low employee engagement. And when you start looking at it that way, you have to say, you know what? There's no room for that kind of leadership in our company. We, that person needs to change. And yeah, and yep. I run in, I run into the, you know, I, and I run into people say, oh, well, that's my style. You know, I, I'm just a hard driving person, and that's uh, my style. I can't change. And I ask them, well, are you that way when you go to your church? Are you that way when you go to your children's soccer game? <laughs> Some of them are in the, in the <laughs> soccer game, quite frankly. <laughs> but uh, are, you, are you that way when you talk to your spouse? Mm -hmm. Oh, of course not. 
well, then mm. you can change. This is not who you are. This is only who you are within the confines of this working environment. This is not who you truly are. So yep. you need to bring some other things into the into the confines of the workplace. So there seems to be that need for um, the res receptivity for change yeah. and continual improvement, doesn't there? Yeah, it, it goes back to, you, you know, you, we have to unlearn what we've learned and you have to unlearn management. I mean, these are management techniques and, and managing people is not going to work. So change, you can change, you can, and it's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight, mm. but you can change and you will see the results if you make those changes. I'd really love to just explore who this book would be most suited to, because I think of the different industry sectors and the different types of people that I've spoken to on the show, for example, <laughs> different leaders and different employees. And there are certain industry sectors that are far more um, inherently stressful than others. Therefore, their leaders have a tougher job by default. Um, yes. Let's talk the medical profession. Is this that, book suitable for them or less have, suitable for them? Yeah, or? sure. If you're the administrator of a hospital or a medical center or something mm -hmm. like that, um, I, I say so you mentioned one earlier and I've done a lot of work in the United States in the oil and gas industry and very mm -hmm. typical there. Um, yep. Uh, the, the, the Wall Street, the, the big financial banking and, mm -hmm. and, and, and the law firms. And, and unfortunately, I think you saw recently in Australia, I think you had a, a worker die who was died at a law firm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, that's correct. And so, so yeah, so those, those organizations put their people under tremendous pressure and, mm -hmm. um, and, and they're going to pay the consequences for it. But you know who the book's for really, Rick? It's yep. for a anybody who leads people. And one of the things I, I, I advocate in the book here is that, you know, if you, my definition of a leader is if you lead people yep. and it, it doesn't matter. Your organization doesn't have to change. If you're running a small department, if you're running the, the, the accounts payable department, uh, you know, you have seven employees working for you. If you implement this just for yourself and for your department, you're going to be seen within your organization as a better leader. Quite frankly, you're going to be start to be seen by other organizations as the kind of one they want to poach. Uh, and at the end of the day, quite frankly, it's also going to make you a better human being. And so, why not do it? Uh, even if Absolutely. even if your bosses don't do it, and yep. you'll be a better leader in your community, you'll be a better leader for your family, you'll be a better leader for uh, your neighborhood, your whatever you're involved in outside yep. the workplace. The benefits are for you, and that's the beauty of it. And the other beauty of being um, human, uh, human beings is that we are fallible, we're not perfect. So there's always that opportunity to, you know, step up our game a little bit, try a new perspective and, and you know, maybe grab your, get a copy of this book. Now, tell us a little bit about the book itself. How is it structured? And is it like a read through from cover to cover or is it more of a guide that you go back to when you need to? It's probably a read through cover to cover, although in many cases, if, if there's something that uh, you're struggling with, you could, you know, go to a particular chapter. So the structure is about, um, you know, obviously the introduction to the concept up front. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a very nice forward from a gentleman who was LinkedIn's first uh, chief HR officer. Officer. Oh, uh, fantastic. He, he, he wrote a book called Work Quake, uh, like mm. Earthquake, Work Quake. Yep, great yep. book. Talking about how organizations need to reorganize. And I it's, uh, highly recommend his book. And then, and then this book, if you reorganize around his thinking and then take these leadership principles in, you'll have a, a wonderful organization. But then there's chapters like um, uh, one chapter dealing with emotional intelligence, one chapter dealing, uh, actually it's called dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity, a chapter on resilience, a chapter on adaptability, one on tenacity, one on building strong relationships. So you, you don't have to necessarily read chapter by chapter, particularly mm -hmm. if you have an issue. There's one about cooperative collaboration. So if you've got drama within your team or if your team members are not cooperating with the uh, other functional areas in your organization, you could go right to that chapter. Um, and then there's kind of a summary of oh, lifelong learning. Lifelong learning is another key uh, aspect of yep. this. And then, um, and then the chapter about how do you create a harmony climate and a harmony culture in whatever part of the business you have influence over. So um, it, yeah, it's, it is a, a, a cover to cover read, but then for those who have specific issues, you could jump right into the, the meat of a particular topic if you wanted to. 
Absolutely wonderful book. Great content, great conversation. Always enjoy the conversation, Steve. Now, um, that being said, if people want to not only get the book, but they want to learn more about you, maybe connect with you and, and, and work with you on leadership skills in their own organizations, tell us a little bit about the services that you might provide. Okay, well, I, I do coaching and mentoring both individual and coaches, uh, sorry, individual and groups, teams. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also, I, I, custom, I put together customized workshops. They can be anything from a half day virtual session to, you know, I'm doing one for a client right now that's a, a four day in-person program. So it really depends on what people need. Yep. Uh, everything I do is customized. Um, and everything you need to know is on calianteleadership.com. So caliente, C-A-L-I-E-N-T-E leadership.com you can find me there you can find me on linkedin twitter um i just started an instagram account for human e leadership oh, i don't know how that's gonna go, go. I'm, no. I'm, I'm, I'm spreading my wings i'm learning yes, as well yes. now <laughs> we'll see how we'll see how that goes the book is is uh right now exclusively through amazon uh mm -hmm. including in australia but around the world both in paperback and kindle and um, so yeah yeah you can grab it anywhere and then i'll be uh uh, finding out that I've got a um, couple of book shows I'm going to later in the year where I'll hopefully have some local local distributors in other parts of the world um, who want to distribute to bookstores, for instance. So, um, but right now on Amazon's the big powerhouse in publishing, so that's the yes. place to go but, uh, for better well, or worse. <laughs> it's it's all happening, Steve. I know that uh, you you um, follow um, what's happening in leadership, and you know as well as I do that things never stay the same for too long. So I I expect that you'll be putting uh, pen to paper soon enough. And now um, with your next uh, <laughs> with your next installment so um, we're looking forward to that now if you if you've been on this call and you've enjoyed uh, the conversation that Steve and I have had and you're a leader or you look, you're aspiring maybe to be a leader certainly do reach out to Caliente Leadership I'll be making sure that uh, you can find that link back to Steve and all of his wonderful work, including his books. And if you want to go direct to the book, which is called Humany Leadership, Mindset, Skills and Behaviors for Being a Successful People-Centric Leader, just go visit Amazon, both .com.au and .com, and you'll be able to find the book. And with all that being said, Steve, great call. Thank you very much for joining me on the show. Thank you. And let, don't let me leave without saying congratulations. I saw your first book earlier this year. So congratulations oh. on joining the world of being an author. It's now yes. in your blood as well. So <laughs> we, we, I look forward to your second book when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> okay, Rick. Take care, my friend. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.